Hi, and welcome back. We're moving on um, with the presentation on suspension, discipline and suspension, and we're going to be looking at suspension from transportation. So with, with suspension from transportation, the removal from transportation is um, very important to understand that the suspension from attendance, so if, you're, if a child is being removed from transportation and the student's attendance is going to be affected, the district needs to look at making appropriate arrangements to provide for the student's education. So the removal from the bus is a day suspension if you do not provide alternative transportation when the, sus when the student is suspended from the bus. So therefore, if, the student is if they are suspended from the bus and the student is unable to get to instruction at the school, then it will be considered a removal from the school as well and from instruction if the school does not provide alternate um, transportation for the student. And again, we're looking at bus suspension um, when it's part of the IEP. So if they're, in, or if they're providing um, transportation for all gen ed students um, to get to and from the school, then if the, the, the child is being removed from school, then they would have to make um, other arrangements. So a district cannot mandate a parent to transport a student to school. So just something to keep in mind, and hopefully you won't have to face your child being suspended from the bus. But if this happens, it's just really important um, to be aware that you need to contact the school and ask them to arrange for alternate um, transportation or remind them, and sometimes it's just a reminder to the district, that because your student can't get to school, that this is going to be now a removal from instruction. And then you can ask about tutoring. And sometimes that will just kind of nudge them a little bit to either provide um, transportation or rethink whether or not they should be suspending the child from the bus and if something else can be done. Now we're looking at pattern of removal, and the school district determines on a case-by-case -case basis whether a pattern of removal constitutes a disciplinary change of placement. The pattern should inc include when the removal happened, the location it happened, it should also have the date and the time. So when we're looking at removal, we're looking at maybe a student every day at math class, during math class is asked to leave and go down to the principal, or they're asked to go into the hallway. Um, that would constitute a pattern of removal. So when we're looking at that, um, that's technically a change of placement. So the change of placement has occurred, and so therefore the pattern has occurred. And then we need to look at, is more support needed, or is this a manifest, do we need to look at manifestation determination because the child has been removed for up to 10 or more days. And so this is important, again, if this is happening, catch it early on and start the paper trail and ask for another CSC meeting, um, go talk to the teacher where this is happening, just to kind of feel, feel out whether or not there needs to be more support put in place. Maybe it is a functional behavior assessment, a behavior plan that's needed to support the student so that the removal stops. And we're really looking at protecting the student when we're talking about discipline and suspension so that the pattern of removal can end and that it doesn't escalate to an actual suspension out of school. So when we're looking at the 10 days or more, this then, um, when a student is suspended for 10 days or more, we're looking at superintendent's hearing to start. Um, so when the school des decides to suspend your child, the school must inform you immediately by phone and within 24 hours in writing. The written notice should include the changes against, the charges against the student. So what happened and what occurred, um, the time and place um, that the conference or the hearing will take place. And if your child is being asked not, not to return to school during the suspension, the location of the alternate site where your child will attend classes. If you do not receive the written notice with the necessary information, the suspension is not official and your child should return to school. The student, the superintendent of schools or hearing offer, officer is the superintendent's he, of the superintendent's hearing shall proceed with the guilt phase and determine whether the student is guilty of the alleged misconduct. And if it is determined that the student is guilty of the alleged misconduct, the superintendent of schools or hearing officer in the superintendent's hearing shall make a determination of whether suspension or, or a removal in excess of 10 consecutive school days um, 
and um, if it and then otherwise it constitutes a disciplinary change of placement um, should be considered. If the determination is that such a suspension or removal should be considered before the superintendent of school, school's orders or the hearing officer in the superintendent's hearing recommends any removal, the superintendent's hearing shall be adjourned until a manifestation determination is made by the manifestation team. So specifically what this is saying, and this is coming from regulation, so it's, it can be a little difficult to understand, um, but what they're saying during the superintendent hearing is that there's going to be a decision on whether or not the conduct that took place actually happened. So did it happen or did it not happen? And it's truly a yes or a no. It's not a maybe. It's not a but this or a but that. It's truly there's going to be a determination of either it's a yes and then you're going to move on to the next stage or it's a no. And if it is a no, then that's good news because that means that the student is going to go right back into their placement, right back into school, and nothing needs to go further except for maybe, maybe you know, a conversation so that it doesn't happen again. Um, but if it's yes, then we're going to move on with the process and we're going to go on with this, uh, with the process as we move along with the slides. So we're looking at, you know, looking at the different steps to take. So when a student is being suspended, step one would be to get the suspension packet from your, your child's school. And the suspension packet is different from the suspension notice that you received from the school. It should include a written statement from your child and any witnesses to the incident. The incident report, the student's academic records, and any other evidence the school plans to use at the hearing, including videotapes. You have the right to review all of this information before the hearing, but the school off, often do not give parents a suspension packet until the morning of the hearing. And to make sure you have enough time to prepare for the hearing, request the suspension packet from the school as soon as you receive the suspension notice. Schedule a time with the school for you to pick it up. And step two is to review the notice of suspension and the suspension packet. And the first thing you should do is read the charges against your child. At the suspension hearing, it, it will be the school's job to show that your child did what the charges say he or she did. If you haven't already done so, talk to your child about what happened. Did your child do what the school accuses your child of doing? What happened leading up to the incident? What happened after the incident? Next, review the written statements in the suspension packet. Note any inconsistencies between the statements. Do the statements say that your child did what the charges say your child did? And step three, the superintendent's hearing should be taken seriously. Dress appropriately and be prepared. It's important to help your child understand the importance of the process and to dress and act in a way that shows respect for the process. And again, the, superint um, the superintendent's hearing is going to be specifically yes or no and then moving on with the process. When we move on the, with the process and it is determined um, that, yes, the student actually engaged in the, the behavior or the conduct that warrants perhaps a suspension, we start to move into the phase of manifestation, manifestation determination, which is a review of the relationship between the student's disability and the behavior subject to disciplinary action. A manifestation determination is a process required by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which, conducts, which is conducted when considering uh, removing a student with a disability, and it constitutes a change of placement. Manifestation determination is a process to determine if the student's behavior problem was or was not a manifestation of the student's disability. A manifestation determination is completed as part of the IEP team meeting, and the IEP team meeting must convene no later than 10 school days when either a parent requests such a meeting following a disciplinary incident, or a student is suspended for five or more consecutive days, or a student is suspended for more than 10 days, or a change of placement for more than 10 consecutive days is being sought for disciplinary reasons or um, they're looking to expel the student. So, and a manifestation determination is an evaluation that answers the questions. One, is it a misconduct in question, is the misconduct in question related to the student's disability, or is the misconduct in question due to an inappropriate um, placement? 
So we're also looking at was it caused by or had a direct and substantial relationship to the student's disability. And this determination must be based upon evaluations, um, evaluation data related to the behavior. It must also um, be recent enough to afford an understanding of the student's current behavior. Misconduct is a manifestation of a disability if it arises from the disability, is caused by the disability, has a direct substantial relationship to the disability, or if the disability significantly impairs the student's behavioral controls. Misconduct is not a manifestation of disability if it bears only a weak relationship to the student's disability. A determination that a student knows the difference between right and wrong does not constitute a determination that the student's misconduct was or was not a manifestation of the disability. And in, ad in ad addition, a district cannot make a determination that the misconduct is or is not a manifestation of a disability based on the student's um, eligibility label. The manifestation determination must be based upon information for a variety of sources, including aptitude and achievement, achievement tests, teacher recommendations, physical conditions, social or cultural background, and adaptive behavior. District staff does not need to use all of the sources of information listed above in every instance. Um, and the, re the point of the requirement is to ensure that more than one source of information is being, um, is being used to make the decision. So now we're looking at um, the direct, or was it the direct result of the failure to implement the IEP? So you can get manifestation. Um, looking at the disability and how it manifests. And you can also get um, it by it, uh, whether if, if it was truly the direct result of the failure of the school staff to implement the IEP. Um, so it must look at whether the behavior was a direct result of the failure to implement the IEP. And for instance, if there is a formal functional behavior assessment and a behavior intervention plan, and they're not being followed, then you may have grounds for manifestation determination. And, and in that case, um, then you will have won that side of it, and then the, the child would then be returned um, to school. And now we're going to move on to the formal manifestation meeting. So just some steps to take when you're going to a formal manifestation meeting. Just make sure that you know the correct date and time of the review, um, location, and representatives that will be there. Uh, request the discipline referral packet that is being sent to the discipline hearing office. It will have those witness reports in there and other important information that's going to help you to advocate for your child effectively. Um, and now that you've gained some time, um, Prepare, to prepare, deter, it's, you're also looking to determine um, if the disability shown on the child's eligibility documentation, doctor reports and evaluation reports, and the IEP is also accurate. Read every document used to support eligibility. Read the child's present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, and this is going to be highlighted in that individualized education plan, your IEP. Read everything you can about the disability and what the manifestations are. And you can find this in the DSM-4. Um, it'll talk very specifically about um, what are some of the fallout areas or how it presents itself on the specific disability. So you want to be very knowledgeable about your child and really understand how their disability affects them and how it manifests so that you can fully and meaningfully uh, participate in the meeting and be able to advocate effectively for your child. And if you don't have current copies of the IEP, the Functional Behavior Assessment, or the Behavior Plan, you may need to request that um, in writing before you get into that meeting so that you can review all of those documents and be as prepared as possible. You also want to prepare any handouts of information that you want them to have ahead of time. Um, for example, you might want to have, you might have quotes from the eligibility documentation or the evaluations used to create eligibility. Um, back up your information as much as possible with quotes and um, you want to use reputable sources when you're doing that. A school psychologist usually attends these meetings, so determine who that psychologist is 
and you may want, you know, to talk with them, you're, you're really focusing on winning the school psychologist over. And if you can win them over and you can get them on your side and, and you can help them to understand your child and how they, how they present themselves and with their behaviors, usually you will win over the team because this person, they're really looking at this person to be the expert uh, when it comes to the behaviors and how they manifest. So if you can really work with that person um, and win them over, you're going to have a pretty good chance. Um, and also, you're going to want to build your case from the ground up because the school will be looking to do the same. Do not rush to conclusions before you know what the conclusion should be. So you really want to have, um, you want to come in open-minded and you also want to really listen um, for clarity and understanding so that you can use the information they present to help build your case as well. And we have also provided you with handouts on manifestation determination so that you can see what the school will be responsible for doing um, and they will help you prepare and be as prepared as possible. If the manifestation team determines that the conduct was indeed a manifestation of the student's disability, the, C, the, the CSE must um, address some of the following areas. It needs to make sure that they're consistently implementing the IEP as written. They need to change the IEP as needed. So sometimes through this process we determine that there could be a need for more supports and services. Um, it definitely it's going to um, bring up the fact that a functional behavior assessment needs to either be developed or it needs to be redone um, and it needs to be accurate and provide a better um, behavior plan to follow. Um, it also is going to be looking at um, the completion of additional evaluations to provide additional services as needed. So does the student need assistive technology? Um, do they need some more, if, they're, if the student's being suspended from math, you know, and, and it's determined that there's some behaviors in math, do they need some individualized support in math? Do they need a research-based um, um, program to help them be successful? So again, you know, as I said at the beginning, Suspension is not a negative. It actually helps to build um, more information and bring data into, it, into the situation that's going to help the child long term and it's going to help the team working with your child so that your child can be as su successful as possible. So discipline and suspension, when it does happen, it doesn't feel good, but it actually helps them to build the case that more support is sometimes needed. So if your student, um, we're looking at returning to prior placement and least restrictive and returning the student to placement from which the student was removed, and this should happen unless the parent and the district agree to a change of placement as part of the modification of the behavior plan. Or we may be looking at not returning them to placement if any of, um, any of the code of conduct um, that were deemed dangerous, so if the, if the student had drugs, controlled substance, weapon, or serious bodily injury happen, then a removal would, would happen. But if a student is found to have their manifestation, um, it was a manifestation of their disability, they should be returned to their prior placement immediately. So if it was a failure, uh, meaning that the manifestation team determines that the conduct in question was a direct result of failure to implement the IEP, then the district must take immediately, immediate steps to remedy those deficiencies. So again, we're looking at manifestation. Is it a manifestation of, of the disability? And if so, then we need to put them back into their placement that they were not going to. And if it was failure to implement the IEP, then that's on the district and the student now gets to go back to the placement as well. And again, even if it was failure to implement um, the IEP and it was more on the school's um, fault there, it still may mean that the student needs a little bit more support or maybe the teachers need a little bit more support so that we can um, kind of nip this and so that this doesn't happen in the future. So again, you know, again, it's data and it's information that we, that we need to have in order to really support students. So questions to ask about uh, functional behavior assessments. So following a determination that the misconduct was a manifestation of the child's disability, a special education student has a right to an evaluation of the underlying causes of the behavior and a plan to address the problematic behaviors. And prior to the manifestation determination meeting review, the FBA, the functional behavior assessment, and behavior plan um, 
you need to make sure that, that if you don't have a copy, ask for a current copy of the review. So before you get to um, before you get to a manifestation determination meeting, make sure you have a copy of the current functional behavior assessment and the behavior plan if you have um, if your student has that plan in place. Um, and you also want to ask yourself uh, before you know talking with the school and going to the meetings is is the plan positive and is it proactive? Because if it's not, then there's a problem, and that's why. Um, the behavior may be occurring. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're talking with um, everybody at the school. And was the current functional behavior plan and FBA, were they followed? Because again, we know if they were not followed and it's part of the IEP, then it, you automatically will have um, manifestation and the student um, will return back to their um, prior placement. So, and if there is no FBA, you're gonna wanna ask if there needs to be a functional behavior assessment done and a behavior plan um, implemented. And if it wasn't followed again, um, you're automatically determined that the incident is a manifestation since it's part of the IEP and they're going to be um, able to go back to class. And following a determination that the misconduct was a manifestation of the child's disability, a special education student also has a right to an evaluation of the underlying causes of the behavior and plan to address those behaviors. So again, these are there's a lot of protections when we're looking at suspending students with disabilities, and it is quite, it's a lot of information I'm throwing at you today. Um, so you can review this, um, you can re review these materials as much as possible, and I have given you a lot of really helpful resources and handouts that can really break this information down further for you, and you'll always be able to reference it back. And again, we don't want these things to happen um, for our children, you know, and we don't want them to be suspended, but when they do, you're going to have a good basis of knowledge, and you're going to have a lot of resources that you can review in the future. And if it wasn't a manifestation, so we just previously talked about it, what if it is a manifestation, then the child goes back to their prior placement. But if it was not found to be a manifestation of the student's behavior, um, the relevant disciplinary procedures applicable to students without disabilities may be applied to the student in the same manner in which they would be applied to any student without a disability. Um, they're still entitled to an edu their educational services um, and those educational services help them um, and enable them to participate in the general education curriculum, although it could be in another setting, but it also needs, their free appropriate education needs to help them make progress towards their IEP goals, and additionally, they must receive services designed to prevent the behavior from reoccurring again. So again, if it is not, if it's found not to be a manifestation of, of the child's disability, then they can be suspended which means they could be suspended for 10 days, they could be suspended for five days, they could have in-school suspension, they could have out-of-school suspension, they could receive tutoring support, but if it is found that it's not a manifestation, then the school does um, have the right to suspend them um, the same at the same um, time limits that they would to any student, regardless of a disability. And what if you don't agree? Um, then we're looking at some safeguards, and the district shall notify the parent of the decision um, and that you have the right to take disciplinary action and of your procedural safeguards no later than the date on which the decision is made. So if you disagree as a parent with the determination that the student's behavior was not a manifestation of the student's disability or with any decision regarding placement, as a parent, you have the right to an expedited due process hearing. And if the district places a student in the allowed placement, the stay put placement is that setting until its expiration or until the hearing officer decision, whichever comes first. So you have the right to an expedited um, um, due process hearing, and you also have the right to a stay put, which means they can't change the IEP, they can't change anything about the placement um, from that point on until you get your um, until you get your voice um, to be heard. And so, if a parent disagrees, you have the right to the due pro to due process, 
this matter and remember that it must be expedited and again I gave you some information in all of your resources and your handouts that does talk specifically about your due process rights and that concludes this section of the training and I thank you again for joining me and have a good one